You are watching the New American Media. Today's program, we're going to talk about all that, and we're going to be joined with Zach Barris. I'd say we should wait no further to bring Zach into the program. So let's just get into it. NBA. <phone rings> Cleveland Cavaliers, LeBron James, talk some Cleveland Browns. <phone rings> Oscar Pistorius, I suppose. Hello. Zach Barris, Brian Engelman, you're live on the air. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm living the dream. I'm doing better than Oscar Pistorius, my friend. I mean, obviously, we want to talk some Cavs, talk LeBron and his streak. We want to talk pre-March Madness stuff, maybe wrap up the Super Bowl and where the Browns go from here. But, you know, that weird story with Oscar Pistorius, what are you making of that? Uh, I mean, I'm going to wait for all the details to come out <laughs> before I actually, you know, before I comment on the story because, like I said, new details are emerging by the, by the minute, it seems like. And... You know, I, I don't know what, you know, now they're saying that he's had past issues of domestic violence. Uh, you know, they're, they're saying there's tons of stuff coming out. So I want to wait, you know, I'm going to wait a couple of days to comment on this story. What, oh, then <laughs> let's say this. What is it's the latest, so as, as as you see it, what is the latest? Okay, you met reference that, that there have been reports, that the, unconfirmed reports perhaps. I mean, that... my, guess, my guess is is that this is just, this is just, I'm just speculating here, but my guess is is because of the soaring crime rate in South Africa which I've been reading about because this article, you know, it's, I mean, it's been, this story is fascinating. And I've looked at it and I've seen basically he's probably paranoid. He had a lot of weapons in the house. You know, I don't think he was expecting his girlfriend to come over at 3 a.m. And she came in the house and he shot her. You know? Yeah. I, I think that's what happened. I, I, I don't know if honestly he meant to shoot her. I highly doubt he did. But at the same time, you know, I, I've never met the guy. I, I have no clue. You know, I'm not close with him. So, but trying to get in someone's psyche when you think about it is I highly doubt he intentionally shot his girlfriend, you know, four times, you know, on purpose. I, I just, I don't think so. I think it was an accident. I feel, you know, I honestly feel bad for the guy. The guy just lost his girlfriend. He shot his girlfriend. Now he's probably going to jail for the rest of his life. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a, it's a pretty tough story, and and you know we don't know all the details just yet. And but but you know we, that's what we do. We talk about the stories as they're coming out, and try to reserve some judgment when it makes sense. And it's just, it's I don't know. I I'll tell you what though, I, if you want to talk about tasteless jokes, but some funny jokes, because it's not a funny situation by any means, obviously. But I'll tell you what, Twitter was full of interesting commentary. I don't know if you had a chance to peruse the Oscar Pistorius comments, but man. You know, it's just a, such a unique story where this runner, born as a double amputee, you know, had to lose both of his legs, and he had to fight. Yeah, he was born without fibulas. Yeah, and he, and he was fighting to, to to get these blades accepted for the Olympics so that he could run with the best of the best, and it was a motivational story. But then Nike had had that advertisement. Did you see that one? The the, the gun related advertisement. No, I have not. 
Okay. Well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna pull it up real quick. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, we we, we don't know the, the the situation of it, but it, it's it is really bad. It's 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 horrible across the board. You know, if he's a dirt bag and he's got a history of this stuff, it's just you hate seeing this happen. And if it was a complete accident, you don't want to see that either. But you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, I feel you know, like I said, if it was a complete accident, the guy's life is completely ruined either way. I mean, he shot and killed his girlfriend. You know. And, and even if he doesn't spend a long time in jail, he still has to live with that for the rest of his life, which isn't going to be easy. You know, I, I know if that happened to me, I'd feel incredibly guilty. And there's a reason why I don't own a gun. I, I don't want anything like that to happen. And, you know, like I said, I don't want to overreact. And it's just me personally. Well, they have a picture, uh, and I pulled this up here. If you search Oscar Pistorius and Nike, there's an advertisement. It's one of these just do it. It's like a time lapse photo, him in the starting blocks. Then he's running, and then he's really running. And it and it says uh, the text of it says, "Slam the bullet in the chamber, just do it." And it's like, oh, oh lord, that's like OJ advertising uh, Ginsu knives or something. Like that is a horrible. Ugh, yeah, this story sucks. I mean, but but you and I, we talk about this. We talk about Lance Armstrong. We talk about Manti Teo. We talk about all these crazy things, and I don't know. Just had to get this out of my system, I suppose. But uh, like you said, as details are emerging, we can move on. Um, I, I guess, I don't know, where do we want to go? We haven't talked since the Super Bowl. We could just wrap that up. We could get into the Cavs and the NBA. We could talk a little pre-March Talk about the NBA first. The trade deadline's approaching, you know, within about a week and a half. Perfect. week and a half, so I think it's perfect. All right, so 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 let, let let let's talk, and and we're probably going to do a shortened show today. We're probably going to do about twenty five minutes here, so we'll try to slam down to brass tacks and give everybody the information they want to know. Give us some of the stuff you're hearing, because you, by the way, this is Zach Barris. He's a lifetime Cleveland sports fan. He's an NBA scout, and Zach knows more about basketball than a lot of people of the commentators getting paid full time to do this on television. Um, but he's also a Cleveland sports fan. You can find him on Twitter. He's at Z Barris. That's Z B A R I S. Follow him on Twitter and keep up to date there. But you, you kind of have your finger on the pulse of, of some of these trade rumors. What are you hearing? Like, what do you anticipate happening between now and the trade deadline? It's, it's definitely hard to tell what deals are, you know, cooking. I mean, I'll find out this weekend when I'm in Houston. You know, I'm supposed to be heading down later this afternoon. So I'll know that, and, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm heading down there to see what exactly is going on, to see, you know, to see what's brewing, you know, to see if, you know, what teams are going to be waking, making which trades. Uh, but I don't think – I think this is going to be a cool deadline. I don't think you're going to see anything completely serious. I don't think you're going to see Kevin Garnett get traded. Uh, the Celtics' unwillingness to trade him just seems, you know, I just don't think it will happen. And, you know, there, there are some deals that will happen. Obviously, I don't think it's going to be anything major. You're not going to see any, you know – if you do see a trade, it will be a Jared Dudley for Ivan Shumpert, that type of trade. You'll see some smaller trades here and there. But like I said, I just don't see the Clippers trading Eric Bledsoe because of the uncertainty with Chris Paul. Even though I do think Paul will re-sign in Los Angeles, I just can't see him going to a better situation. Right. Uh, but like you said, there's always that possibility he does walk in free agency. You can't trade the best backup point guard in the NBA <laughs> who's still in his early 20s. You just, you just can't do it. You know, so I, I just don't see the Clippers pulling the trigger on any major deal there, even though it can net them a championship, I just don't see it happening. Well, you know, what we'll Sterling, do, Zach, we'll we'll pardon the Oscar Pistorius pun with pulling the trigger on the trade. We'll give. Well, I, I will not. Okay. I will not call attention to that like I just did. <laughs> okay, so it just I don't see the Clippers doing anything major. I mean, the Lakers. It makes you wonder: Will they trade an injured Pau Gasol? I, I don't know. I, I mean, it seems like Cup Chicken Butts and Jim Butts have been really unwilling to make deals. You know, it seems like they have in their head that they put this super team together in L.A. And that they still feel it could be a Super Bowl. We're eight and three in our last eleven. Now they're eight and four. You know, it's still only a six sixty six winning percentage, and in the NBA, that's not anything dominant. Right. You know, that's that's you know, that's literally you know going you know like it's just above fifty. It's it's a fifty four win season for the most part. It's it's nothing special. It's a good season, but it gets you a number five seed in the West. You know, so I, I just don't understand what their unwillingness is to deal. You know, a player like. Gasol or even Dwight Howard. I mean, Dwight Howard, you know, if the guy was staying in L.A., I think he would have just said already, you know, listen, you guys have nothing to worry about. I plan on playing my, you know, I plan on ending my career or signing a three or five, six year deal. You know, I plan on signing a max contract, you know, but he hasn't even said that, which makes me wonder, is Dwight staying in L.A. or not? You know, if it were me and I were the Lakers and I could get Al Horford for him, I'd pull the trigger. You know, if I get Al Horford and Jeff Teague in a deal, I, I make the move. 
You know, I, I just don't understand why the Lakers, you know, and Howard isn't even having a great season. He doesn't fit in D'Antoni's system. The Lakers, like I said, they've been very stubborn. They won't fire D'Antoni. Like I said, I don't think it's all the coach's fault. I really don't. You know, they were terrible with Mike Brown, who was a completely defense, you know, was a complete defensive coach. You know, it's just, I think they have issues. I think the spacing is a big problem with Howard and Gasol. You know, Gasol is a post-up player, you know, and he doesn't do well with Howard, and they're the same. They, they both play better when each other's not in the lineup. It's just that they have this, they have a bunch of great players, but nothing – they don't play well together. It's a great team on paper. And I think that's the problem there. And I, I think it's enough talk about the Lakers. Well, you well know, I, let, me, let me add this on the Lakers, because it, it is our backyard team. Zach, Zach resides out here in Los Angeles, although you travel all the damn time now. Um, I tore my labrum. And, and I, I played football, I played tennis, I played basketball in, in, in high school and, you know, pick up games and stuff after that. And, and I've dealt with injuries. I've, I've, I've dealt with ankle issues. I've dealt with, you know, just you get banged up when you play sports. That's fine. But when I tore my labrum in, in the shoulder, it was one of those things that would get better until you had to act normal again. And it, and it would just irritate it to the point, not just like, ah, that, that, that's really irritating. Like, you can't lift things. I couldn't lift grocery bags a certain way. I couldn't hold any weight in certain ways. And they say when, when pe- defenders are slamming down on his arms that that's re-aggravating it. I'll tell you what, if he's got a bum labrum, he's not the player that he was in Orlando. He's, he's no, he not... clearly isn't the player he was in I mean, his point totals are down almost, you know, anywhere from eight. He's down about eight points a game yeah. from where he was. His rebounding is down. His blocks are down. You know, everything about him, his, his, shooting, his true shooting percentage is down. His free throws have been abysmal. I mean, he's always been a bad free throw shooter, but now he's just, I mean, he's god-awful. I mean, he's Ben Wallace status or, you know, <laughs> Andres Biedrin's on the Warriors status. You know, I mean, that bad we're talking. And, you know, where he's cost the Lakers numerous games this year because of his inability to shoot free throws. And you have to take into account that it just seems like Dwight just doesn't care. He doesn't have that winning attitude. And... Whenever I hear these people out in L.A. going, you know, and I'm going to bring this up right now because I just think it's hilarious, is when I hear all these people in L.A. going, why would we choose the Cavaliers over the Lakers in free agency in a year and a half? And I go, I go, well, it's just, I, I said, I, I'm not going to get in this when you people go, well, you're a Cavs fan. I go, I go, listen, I'm not a Cavs fan. I don't work for the Cavaliers. I work for a rival franchise. I, I do not, you know, in the Eastern Conference, I do not work for the Cavaliers. So I'm not going to sit here and sugarcoat and say, oh, the Cavaliers are going to be the best team in the league. I'm just saying what's possible, you know, what, what the most realistic possibility is. And that I just can't see LeBron going and teaming up with Dwight Howard. I just don't think Dwight is the guy you can build a franchise around. You know, look at the way his career ended in Atlanta. Look at the saga that's going I mean, I mean in Orlando, I'm sorry. Look at the saga that's going on here in L.A. It just this seems like a guy, he's just like a, he's like a nine-year-old. You know, he's like a nine-year-old not getting his way at his birthday party. And... You know, that's all I can picture with Dwight is just why would anybody want him? You know, I don't even know if he's – I mean, obviously he's a max contract because there's only a few guys in the NBA that are worth it. But like I said, I mean, Dwight is a huge risk at this point. You know, if he never fully recovers from the back injury, he just doesn't seem to care enough. You know, he's always smiling even when they're down 25 points in a game. You know, he, he constantly calls out players. Well, you know, you, his, what it is, you can't coach Hart. You know, you can't coach drive and determination. But but like I was saying with Dwight, and we, we, can, we can wrap it up on, on, on Dwight and move along here, but he needs to get healthy. I've torn my labrum, and it was unlike a lot of other injuries I've had where it just, it until you go in and clean it up and attach it and take your rehab and go down for a couple of months and address it, you're not going to get better. This isn't an ankle that's a little tender and then it gets a little less tender if you don't re-aggravate it. This is something that will not get better until you go under the knife. I know because it took me about a year and a half, two years of realizing this is not improving. I need to address this crap. And, and that's what I had to do. And, and really, Dwight Howard, I, I don't think he's going to be much in the NBA until he addresses that. You know, and you got Kobe calling him out. You got his dad making comments. And it's just, it, it's a mess. But it was a mess in Orlando. So this is what we've come to expect from Dwight Howard at this point. So, you know, it, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. The Lakers are three and a half games out of the eight seed in the West. You, you never know if they can get get hot, get warm. And when you got Kobe Bryant on your team, you always have a chance. But it does seem like the Lakers have, have picked their team. They're just going to roll with it. They're going to see how the year plays out. I don't I don't see them making a lot of changes. I could be wrong, but I think they made their bet. I, I, I think the only player that's even going to be on the, cho- on the chopping block in a trade 
is Pau Gasol. And I don't even think that happens because of, you know, the plantar fasciitis. I, I just can't see it happening right now. Um, I mean, will it? Maybe. I mean, like I said, the Lakers, the Lakers are very stubborn and, you know, they put together a lot. You know, they went this offseason together. You know, you know, Steve Nash is clearly on the decline. It's happened. And I think the Lakers are just unwilling to look as this team that, you know, they had pegged as their super team, they could go out and crush Miami in the playoffs is what they were expecting. You know, oh, Miami doesn't have a great center and they don't have an elite point guard. You know, we're going to be able to crush them in those areas. And we put Kobe on Wade, you know, you know, the only piece that they have that can dominate is LeBron, you know, and Powell can evenly match Fosh. And our bench is better than them. And it just isn't like that at all. You know, Miami, and I said, even it took Miami a year to match, but Miami still made the title. You know, I mean, they still made the championship. And we're very close to a title in their, you know, in their first season together. And last season, you know, they really meshed. But don't forget, you had three guys in the prime of their careers that were two of them were the best, two of them were the three or the five best players in the NBA. You know, with LeBron being the best and Wade being a top five player. So, right. you know, LA does not have that. You know, as good as Kobe is, Kobe has some off nights. You don't ever see LeBron putting up four points in a game. I, I just, I, I don't ever, I, I don't think I've ever seen that. No, you know, no, no. I, same here. I mean, he's been you know, Kobe's. Kobe's Consistent. a much more one-dimensional player than LeBron. You know, when Kobe scores, you know, he scores. You know, he can put up a ton of points. He's what did he have? Scorer. He had, so what was it, 73 points, zero assists that one game several years he, back, something like had, that? Yeah, I remember he had 81 points in the game. And, you know, <laughs> you know, he. but the thing is with Kobe is, you know, I was I, I had some friends over the other day, and someone was talking about how Kobe's a better passer than LeBron. I go, are you out of your mind? He goes, he goes, he goes look, he's, he's put up over 10 assists in every game. I go, I go, LeBron averages almost eight assists a game. I was like, and he's still putting up in, you know, he's still putting up around thirty points in the process. I said, Kobe puts up like eight points a game, nine points a game when he's giving up when he's you know, when he has the double digit assist game. I go, he's just a one dimensional player. That's all he is at this point. I said, you know, he can only do one or the other. He it's not like he's putting up twenty seven and ten. Yeah. I go, he's not doing that. You know, when he puts up he puts up twenty seven and two or he puts up eight and you know, puts up eight points and ten assists. I said he's very one dimensional. I go I go, and LeBron, I said LeBron's a quick passer. He's, you know, LeBron's obviously one of the best passers in the game. Uh, clearly, has playing, been for years. If he was strictly years. playing point guard, I, I truly believe the guy could average over 10 assists a game if he was playing a true point guard. If player. he wanted to play like Magic, he could, he, oh, he's he been one of the best passers in the game for many, 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 many years. Being Cleveland yeah. fans, we've watched most of those games anyway, so we know. Yeah, exactly my point. And, you know, he's honestly he's one of the best passers I've ever seen play the game. And, Agreed. Same here. But, but, but getting back to getting back to the trade rumors and stuff for other teams. Yeah. Uh, you know, since a lot of Clevelanders listen to the show, the Cavaliers are probably going to sign Greg Oden. It's you know I don't want to say it's a hundred percent, but it's as close as you can get to it right now. It's between the Bobcats and the Cavs, and the Cavaliers are a much better situation for Greg Oden than yeah. the Charlotte Bobcats. You know. Now, Greg now Oden do, you, do you know where he's from? Do you know where he's State. Do you know where he's from? I know he played in 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 Columbus. Greg Oden is from Indianapolis. Okay, so close. You know, that's a hop, skip, and a jump from family. But too. he he lived in Columbus during the off season. You oh, know, Mike okay. Conley Senior is his agent. Conley's gotcha. also from Indianapolis too. That you know, Mike Conley and Greg Oden were on the same. You know, they were on the same team in high school. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, and you know, Conley Senior represents him, but Greg Oden's taking classes at Ohio State. He lives in Columbus. Hey, you know, you know, the, the thing with Greg Oden, I saw the Cleveland Indians. Whether it was Kevin Millwood, or you can go down the list of pitchers that we pick up, and you know. Uh, you know, they've had injuries or they had an off year. And we've been able to get a lot of mileage, a lot of pretty decent production for cut rate value out of a lot of pitchers over the years from the Cleveland Indians organization. And if Greg Oden, you know, I mean, at this point, you can't risk a well, lot on him. But if you get well, decent production, Odin, though, huge and ceiling. I think it also has to do with the fact that the Cleveland Clinic is in town and they're, you know, oh, okay. they're known for the rehab. The Cleveland Clinic is a fantastic hospital. <laughs> it is. As long as it's you don't talk about staff game. infections and Kellen Winslow and uh, Joe Jervis. Well, that was and... the that was the Browns. It, it was those were all causing the training facility. I don't okay. know what it was. <laughs> I don't either, but, but hopefully it's gone now that Al Liner's but, gone. But Greg Oden also has to take a look at his Andrunas Ogalskis thing. Ogalskis. Good point. Had, really good point. You know, he had all the he had all the foot injuries at the beginning of his career. Tons like of he didn't have to retire before his career started. Right. Right. And. Look at look at what a promising career he had. He was a you know I think he was a he was either a two or three time All Star. You know he had a very successful career, and I think the Cavaliers though also look at it at the same point where if you sign Odin, you'll have a lot of front court depth between Verjao, Thompson, Zeller, Odin, and Space because I Jeez. think they plan on keeping Space too. Now someone said the other day to me they go well, 
Greg Oden, you know, how's he going to play 40 minutes a minute? They go, they don't need him to play 40 minutes a minute. No, they go, no, no. When you're a championship contender with Greg Oden, what you want him is you want a guy who can play 15 to 20 minutes a night, give you solid defense, you know, and be able to play at the end of the game. I said, that's what you want out of Greg Oden. You're not looking for him to be the next Bill Russell, you know. I said, you're looking at him to go in there in crunch time and stop Dwight Howard, to be able to stop a guy like Andrew Biden if he's healthy or you know, be able to go up against Joe Kim Noah in the playoffs. You know, you need someone like that. You know, especially when Verjao's tired or, you know, or Thompson's tired. Or Brooke you Lopez in the East or you get into foul trouble or yeah, something. Yeah, ex- sure. exactly. And that's why you need a guy like Odin. If the guy can play 15 to 20 minutes a night, give you six, seven points and give you eight boards and a couple of blocks, I mean, you're getting a guy who's incredibly efficient. Yeah, and especially if you, you need, especially you know, if the payroll is one, two, or three million with incentives. I mean, you're not bankrupting your team by going for it by any means. Yeah, exactly. And Maury Spates is still there as a the guy who can score. Well, let's you talk know, about Spates Tyler for a Miller. second. Let, let, let's go back because I, I wanted. You said it, it might be kind of a slow trade deadline. We'll see how it goes. You know, obviously until people make their decisions, you, you're not certain, but. Um, let's talk about the trade that the Cavs made. I, I know we kind of addressed it before, but as it's been a few weeks now, they've gotten together. It, it really looks like the Cavs got a lot of depth, and and on top of a first round pick, I, I don't know. Oh, I, I seem I, real I happy agree. with this trade. I, I mean, they've gotten you know, Maurice Space is a guy who can come off the bench. He's one. I've always been a huge fan of Space. You know, I was hoping the Cavaliers would draft him a couple of years ago. Instead, you know, we wound up going to the Sixers. You know, but don't forget, this is the guy who always wanted to be drafted by the Cavs. The Cavaliers front office has loved the guy for a long time. And, you know, he's still only in his mid-20s. I, I tend to think that he will be a Cavalier next year. I don't think they'll trade him. Granted, it's always a possibility. I think if the right offer comes, I think the Cavaliers are going to sit there and listen to it. That's what Chris Grant does. You know, he's not hesitant to pull the trigger. But at the same time, if he feels he can get a mid-first-round pick for space, he's going to go ahead and pull the trigger. He's going to do it. You know, if if it's going to be a really late one, like you know, a team. I'm not saying, I'm not saying. I'm just saying, for example, a team like Miami or Oklahoma City, we're willing to give up the 30th pick or somewhere around there. I don't know if he pulls the trigger on that. Right. Thing. Hey, let me you let know, me it, ask it, you it, let me ask you something about the trades real quick because that that just reminded me of something. Can, can you just update us on how the Cavs first round pick with the Lakers works? If they if the Lakers make the playoffs, the Cavs can swap the Miami pick with them. But if they don't, we can't. Yes. And if they don't, that pick goes to the Phoenix Suns. Oh, so we lose everything. So we need to be rooting for the yeah, Lakers. Yeah, no, no, then time. they have the Miami Heat pick. The Cavaliers would only Yeah, but that, that, that's Cavaliers probably going to be the second Heat pick. That's probably going to be the second it'll last be, pick. It'll probably be around 26 to 27. Because yeah. the Heat would be the fifth. I think the Heat would be fifth in the, in the Western Conference. Does it just go by so regular? It was, does it, or in the Eastern? It, yeah, it go, yeah, yeah. After the lottery, it goes by best record. Oh, okay. So, so when it, it it goes through all the teams, and if you have three of the best teams in the West, and then two in the East, maybe the Heat or one or two in the East, but they're behind San Antonio, the, the Thunder, or something that that it would yeah, be. Yeah, I mean, you could be looking, you could be looking at the fifteenth pick. pick in the draft, though. I mean, yeah, that's if, a if big the difference. Lakers do make the West. So, Cavaliers fans, it at both points should either you know because you have to think into the future too, and like I said, there still is that slight possibility where Cavaliers fans do have to think about it. I know some of them hate it, but Cavaliers fans do sometimes have to think, if the Lakers do make some playoffs, Dwight Howard is a for sure, for sure, he's long gone, probably going to Dallas, would be my guess. Because I don't, I just don't know if he'd go back, to, I, I just don't know if he'd go home to Atlanta. You know, that's where he's from, I just, because I, I just don't think he's in love with Atlanta. Um, I could definitely see him, though, going to Dallas. I, I see that as being a big possibility. And... If you know, and that that definitely eliminates LeBron heading to the Lakers in two years. I, I think if Dwight leaves, I I just can't see him playing with Dwight in the first place. Yeah. But you know, and then the second part, I believe that if the Lakers, you know, if the Lakers do make the playoffs and they get in that eighth seed, Cavaliers are going to have a high pick. You know, that'll allow them to draft a Trey Burke style point guard. You know, a, a Trey Burke type player. You know, who they can plug in as a backup point guard for the long term. You know, I think Trey Burke has an excellent future ahead of him as an NBA point guard. Yeah, he's undersized, but I, I think Byron Scott could definitely mold him into a great backup point guard, and I think that's what the Cavaliers desperately need for the future. They need a guy who can play the backup point. Because and Kyrie Irving I, I, is great, but he's fragile. Yeah, Trey Burke is going to come up ball right out of the lottery. He's going he's to be right there, right beyond the lottery. And if the Cavaliers can land that 15, 16 pick, they can get Trey Burke. Hey, t- hey talk, talking talking about the lottery real quick. What, what happens to Nerlens Noel with his injury? Because he, re- I don't oh, think that's... he falls out. I don't think he falls out of the top five. I was saying this the other night. I was saying okay. it's terrible. You know, we won't be the number one overall pick. I just can't see a team taking a shot on him with the ACL tear at the number one. You know, 
because Ben McLemore will be there, and I'm a huge fan of McLemore uh, on Kansas, the shooting guard. You know, he, everything about his game, I love this guy. I, th- I, I think he's a future all-star in the NBA. I don't know about superstar, but definitely an all-star. Um, but at the same point, if you're sitting there at pick number four and Shabazz Muhammad and Nerlens Noel are both on the table, do you take the risk with a guy like Muhammad who's had a really down year with UCLA? Is that just a problem with the system fit? Because that happens a lot of the time with Howland guys. You know, Kevin Love was great in college, but he wasn't amazing. He didn't live up to his potential. Darren Collison, another guy who was just an average college player. Russell Westbrook, the same. You know, and then suddenly these guys go to the NBA and they're ten times better than what they were in college because Ben Howland's system is slow and doesn't really it doesn't really showcase any of the talent. So, do you take Shabazz Muhammad or Nerlens Noel? I think Noel falls into that two to five range now, just depending on team need. And I mean, it's scary to think though, too, at the same time where if Oklahoma City picks number six with the Raptors pick, and Noel falls to six, they can easily sit Noel out for the year, let him rehab, and suddenly you're coming back with a team with Noel, Perkins, Durant, and Westbrook. I mean, that, that's a really scary thing to think about. But I tend to think she doesn't fall out of the top five. Now, where do you th- where do you think the Cavs are going to finish with with the Bear Zhao injury and with Kyrie being down? I think and- they're going to finish anywhere in the top four to five picks. I, I tend to think. I don't see them falling any lower than that. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I hopefully, you know, for the Cavaliers, you know, like I said, this is going to be their truly last bad season. You know, it's unfortunate that Andrew Wiggins and Jabari Parker are still a year away because, you know, those guys, Andrew Wiggins would definitely, you know, if the Cavaliers were somehow able to draft him, it'd definitely help if they could get him. You know, they wouldn't need LeBron. Andrew Wiggins is going, he's the best prospect in the past 10 years since LeBron James. Oh, okay. And Jabari Parker projects is kind of the next Carmelo type, you know, he's a fantastic scorer, you know, I, I, I want to see him in college, you know, it's hard to evaluate high school players going against, going against such marginal talent, you know so I want to see that, you know, before it's, that's why I said, it's like, I used to evaluate high school talent, I feel it's a lot harder though to to judge those guys based on their competition until they're going up in a showcase, I think that's when it's a lot easier to determine how good they're going to be and I watched Andrew Wiggins last year in the Nike Hoop Summit up in Portland just tear it up. You know, the guy put over over 30 points. You know, I think the guy had close to a triple double in the game, you know. You know what that that, that reminds me cuz I mean, unbelievable. You you've, you've you've brought him up a couple of times and and one of one of our regular listeners uh, on on the YouTube channel that 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 comments on at basically any time we're talking NBA and, and most of the times that you're on here uh, he'll, he'll tend to leave comments. He'll listen to the whole show, and he'll pepper us with about twenty different comments. Like really, just kind of joining the show after the fact. I don't know if you've ever been on the the, the page to go back and maybe respond to some of them, but I, I, I believe off the top of my head that that one of the comments was, "I don't know what you're seeing in Andrew Wiggins. I don't, I don't know, I don't know that that he's really all that." So I, I, I love that. Andrew Wiggins' game. I'm a, I've been a huge fan of him since I, I started watching him a few years ago. I've seen him in a lot of the. Uh, a lot of the summer showcase, I, I, everything about the kid just just says to me that he's going, that he has a chance to be, you know, the next star player in the NBA. Yeah, well, you know, he's got a big, a big frame, just a, you know, solid player. He can, he, he's so good in every aspect of his game. You know, like I said though, but he's still a high schooler. You know, I used to watch LeBron in high school. I went to, I went to some of his games. You know, when they would play the Convo, you know, in downtown Cleveland. Yeah, and. LeBron's jump shot was nothing to write home about. I mean, he was, his jump shot, was he was hitting about 35% of the time. His jump shot was very weak. You know, he was just a great dunker, and he was great at taking it to the hole. You know, but his jump shot... Well, but he was a good passer of, then, too, though. He was also a good passer. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. His jump shot needed a ton of work, though. He, I right. remember he started out in the game against Oak Hill. He started out over six. And, uh, when he was on the Cavs know, was, the first couple of years, he was three-point happy. It was launching bricks like crazy. Like, I got to figure out how to yeah. shoot these threes. It's like, dude, you're, you're six foot eight. You're a man child. You are a beast. Get down in the paint and do something different than jacking up three pointers. You know, now you watch him, he's over 60% for how many games in a row. He just missed it again last night. Um, you know, yeah, his, his he was game like is. He's like 58 and a half percent. Yeah. Like 58.7, I think. Uh, he's and really hitting his stride. He's been MVP before, but he's still playing like maybe even better than I just he has. Been. Especially after watching him blow Oklahoma City out of the water last night. Like I said. As, as yeah, they couldn't get close. I, I, OKC just couldn't crack that 10, 12-point margin. They, every I mean, time they made a run, they were stopped. It was very, ugh. I mean, it, it, it like I, Like deflated. I said at the beginning of the year, when Oklahoma City traded James Harden, they essentially traded their window to win a championship this year, which I don't believe. I, I believe in the NBA, if you have the chance to win a title, you take that risk of losing him in free agency. You know, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe Oklahoma City does go and win the title this year, but I, I don't know... 
if Kevin Martin's the best six man in the league to help you do that. You know, like I said, Miami Miami's a better team than Oklahoma City. They proved it in the playoffs this year. They just dominated them. You know, in the championship. I mean, Oklahoma City was knocked out in five. You know, do I think the same thing will happen this year? I don't know. Miami is a pretty easy road to the title. You know, especially considering that, you know, that they, you know, Indiana doesn't present enough of an offensive threat to beat Miami. Um, New York might Chicago be interesting. Right now, Chicago without I, I, I think, Derrick Rose. I think, I think New York would go down in five. Okay. I think New York would go down in five to Miami. Maybe six, but definitely five. Chicago, the problem is that Derrick Rose isn't healthy. You know, Boston without Rajon Rondo. I mean, there's well, a lot yeah, of... Yeah, exactly. Chicago lacks a complete elite score without, without Derrick Rose in the lineup. Now, next year, I think that'll change. But What about Derrick Indiana, Rose though? Playing, what about, do, Indiana, like I just said, Indiana lacks the offensive threat. They're a very okay. good team defensively. But when you have a guy like, you know, the problem is when Indiana is playing these close games, when it's 72-69, to 69, and Miami has Dwayne Wade and LeBron James that, have, you know, that are the best players on the fast break in the league, can easily get some quick steals. You know, Miami has those abilities to go on these 12-0 runs within, you know, less than a minute. I've seen it happen multiple times. You know, and they, you know, and that's the problem with Indiana. Indiana's, Indiana's just offensively challenged, and they don't present a huge threat to Miami. Now, that's what happened last year. Had, you know, had Indiana run a different offensive system, I think they could have beaten Miami. I think Miami was very vulnerable last year during the playoffs. But, you know, Indiana, Indiana took not, them I, I, to I, I, the limit. Indiana could have put the nail in that coffin. Indiana had them and couldn't do it. Uh, that's when LeBron figured out what it means to be a champion. I, I, th- I know, think I he like, figured it out I last like year with with the Mavericks. But, coach, yeah. but his offensive sets are some of the, the worst I've ever seen, and I'm saying that in all honesty. You know, they're worse than Mike Brown's offensive sets when he was with the Cavs, and I'm being, you know, I'm being so truthful on that. It's just hard to watch. You know, they're, they're, they're sitting there taking, you know, the entire 24-second shot clock, you know, to get off their shot. It's just, it's a, you know, they weren't, they weren't a fast team. Now, that could all change when Danny Granger comes back with the, with the emergence of Paul George, you know. Right. They could totally change. But the Granger thing could also hurt them. You don't know. Um, but, team you know, chemistry Rangers, is huge. Team chemistry is huge. You can't just throw your Lakers together and win a chance. The Lakers or, or the the Yankees have thrown together super teams and not got it done. It takes a second to figure out everybody's roles. So when you add from a player under- or subtract someone, it changes yeah, and, stuff. And from what I understand right now is that I hear the Pacers are planning on moving Paul George to the two when Granger comes back, and Granger will play the three, and that'll allow them basically you know to create more offense. I don't know if that'll necessarily work on paper. Like I said, it sounds good. But, you know, whenever you have something on paper, it doesn't necessarily translate well to being a great team. Right. And, you know, it's like, it's like on paper a couple of years ago, the Heat went and signed all these three-point shooters. They had LeBron, Wade, and Bosh. You know, they had the perfect compliments, but they were exposed. You know, they were a better team than Dallas. Dallas just, Dallas just outplayed them. You know, Tyson Chandler was so effective defensively, Miami didn't have an answer for Oh, him. Jason Terry and J.J. Barea, those guys stepped it up yeah. and were clutch. And, and, that's, and that's the thing. is, Dallas on paper was not the best team in the but NBA. But they were clutch. Year. Exactly. And that's the thing. Is like, I still think the best team on paper is San Antonio. I said that last year. I said there was only one team last year who I felt that really could have given Miami a total run for their money, and that was San Antonio. But Oklahoma City, San Antonio wound up getting tired. They couldn't beat them. They couldn't finish them off. And Oklahoma City wound up going. And granted, I think San Antonio was the better team. I still think San Antonio would have won that series in five or six last year against Miami, and I say the same thing this year. Well, as long it, as they're it, healthy. Greg Popovich held, held Tim Duncan out for being old. <laughs> that was so awesome when he held him out of the lineup. What's the reason? Old. <laughs> I mean, that's fine. That's so I mean, funny. They have the best record in the, Absolutely. The best record in the NBA. Yeah, 42 you know, wins. Nobody fine. else is if in the 40s. you want to sit the guy every four or five games, you know, you don't need to, you know, there's no reason to have to win 68 games this Yeah, but year, David you know? Stern comes in and finds him. I Whatever. $250,000 to an organization is nothing. You know, and that, that's how you have to look at it like that. And I, I tend to think that, I, I think, like I said, there's only two true teams that I think they can give my three true teams that can give Miami a, a run for their money. And I, I still think that San Antonio, I think, will give them a true run. I think that Oklahoma City will, even though I still think Miami can beat Oklahoma City. And I, I think that the L.A. Clippers can also give them a nice challenge, too. I really like the Clippers. The roster is very deep. 
I'm not saying Miami will, I'm not saying will beat Miami, but they'll definitely give Miami a series. Okay, so we're talking with NBA scout Zach Barris. Follow him on Twitter at Z Barris. That's Z B A R I S. Uh, th- here's what I want to do. I want to kind of do a little prognostication as, as who we're going to see in the championships: Eastern Conference, Western Conference, and then I want to do a lightning round. Just kind of quickly touch on, you know, just any Super Bowl thoughts. Cleveland Browns. It, it, it's it's a slow time, but free agency is getting ready to start. The Indians are getting ready for pre, uh, you know, for spring training and stuff. We'll just do a quick lightning round after this but I'm, I'm kind of curious because you, you seem to be a real big Clipper fan do you think the Clippers hand let me phrase this differently I got two ways to say this and I'm jumbling them together is there a huge drop off after the Clippers when you're talking Memphis Denver Golden State Utah Houston huge drop off there like I think, I think Memphis has been a big drop I think Denver's <laughs> figuring it out I think Denver's been okay. figuring out their so they could be season. dangerous I think Denver's getting better and better as the season's gone on I mean don't forget this is a team that was 500 through its first I think 25 or 30 games, you know, they weren't playing great basketball, and now they're starting to play really, really well. Okay. So I think Utah's a huge, uh, Utah's just far back. Portland's far, far back. Memphis, now that they, Memphis doesn't have a bench, you know. They traded space, they traded, you know, Ellington was okay for them, but Ellington's been good for the Cavs. And, you know, you look what they traded, they gave up Rudy Gay, you know, for Tayshawn Prince. You know, I, I just don't think I, – I think Memphis is one of those teams, too, that can give Miami a run for their money because they had so much depth in the front court and so much size. And they really matched up well against Miami in the regular season. In the past, past tense. Years. In the past tense, you're saying. But, yeah, but after I, the trade, no more. Memphis, I don't see Memphis winning the West. Okay, so so now let me let me jump to the East, and then we'll, we'll narrow this back down to the Eastern Conference, Western Conference, two teams standing. Uh, you got Miami, New York, Indiana, Brooklyn. Where, where do you see the elite in the East? It's obviously Miami. Who else is in there as far as – I think Miami's the only elite team in the East right now. I think if Derrick Rose is back for Chicago, put them up there. You know, but like I said, if Chicago lacks right now the dynamic score that they need to beat a team like Miami – Granted, I think Chicago will take out the Knicks in five, even without Derrick Rose. Look what they've done to them in the regular season. They've just destroyed them. Yeah. You know, with the emergence of Jimmy Butler in Chicago, he's been fantastic. You know, when Lil Dang was out, you know, he, he's a dominant three off the bench. You know, he's very, very good. And I just believe that, that Chicago would take out New York no matter what. I don't think New York wants to face Chicago in the playoffs because they know they'll be taken out in the second round. If that's the case, okay. If Chicago gets in there, three seed. New York will not be happy. Just trust me on that one. So then, um, so so Miami being the elite, who do you see at the end of the day standing? Number one, number two, who's going to be in that battle? Do you think it's going to be Chicago, leapfrogging Brooklyn, I, I, Pacers, I think was, Knicks? I, I think I I think the uh, I think honestly it'll be the Pacers or the Bulls or the Knicks. I, I mean, going at number going in the two spot. I, I think right now it'll be the Knicks regular season. They're the number two seed. So well, let me let me let me two. let me say one thing though with, with the Celtics. You always count them out, and they're always too old. But when it comes down to clutch, I mean, they, they they kind of turn it on when they need to. They're obviously injured without Raja, Rajon Rondo, and with, with uh, Solinger going down. They're seven and one without Rondo, though. I mean, they've been playing really well without him. Well, they're I mean, they're four four games above five hundred. It's a team that is not what it used to be, but you know, it's a team with a lot of veteran experience. And is it safe to write them off, or is it one of those? No, be I mean, honestly, you can't write them off because look what they did. I mean, they took Miami to seven last year. They should have beaten Miami. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they should have. Miami played terrible in the playoffs last year until the finals. They were horrible. You know, they should have lost to Indiana, and they should have lost to the Celtics. You know, they were very fortunate that Indiana just played terrible down the last, you know, the last couple games. You know, the last three games of that series, they were horrible. You know, they were up 2-1, to one and they suddenly, you know, they lost 4-2. to two. And the Celtics, the same thing. The Celtics were up 3-2, to two, going back with home court advantage, you know, in game six, and they blew it. Well, let, let's you know, let, let's mark it down. Your two teams in the East, then it's Miami and. Like I said, it all depends on Derrick Rose. If Derrick Rose comes back, it'll be Miami and Chicago. If not, I think it's Miami and Indiana. Okay, and New York is. Just I mean, it could be the Knicks. Too. I just the problem with the Knicks is if the Knicks get matched up against Indiana or Chicago, it's not going to be an easy matchup for them to win. Okay. Well, it's going to be fun to see. Obviously, you know, you know I root the for anyone not named the Heat. Dominated by the Bulls this year, just dominated. Well then, then look at the, let's look at the West then, and, and, and let's wrap up our NBA chat here because we're starting to run out of time. The the top four teams you got the Grizzlies, the Clippers, the Thunder, and the Spurs. Call it. Who are the two out of those four solid teams? Obviously, I, I don't think you're going to call the Grizzlies Spurs, after the trade. Spurs and OKC. But in the Clippers is the redheaded stepchild, like, kind of like the Blake Griffin. I think I think the Clippers are right there though. Like I said, they're right there. 
Uh, they're very, very close. They're on the edge. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying the Clippers can't win it, but I just think the Spurs are a better team, and I think the uh, I think the Thunder are a better team too. But that doesn't mean you know the Clippers are both evenly matched with both of them. You know, very close. It, it, you know, it basically as close as it can be without you know being there. All right. Well, uh, I'll tell you. Clippers- Clippers are the third best team in the West. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. We're we're not even at the All Star break, so we'll we'll save a little bit of, of the. Uh, we'll see how some of the season plays out. I mean, Derrick Rose. I mean, you see him out there doing doing warm up drills and stuff, but he's he's injured, and he's saying if I'm and if I'm not 110, percent I'm not risking my career on this. I, I don't blame the guy, but on the same. I don't, I don't blame him either. You know, like I said, it's, you have to look for the long term. I agree. You know, you have to look for the long term of the franchise here too, and the long term of his career. And basically, if Derrick doesn't feel he's healthy. No one's going to pressure him to come back when he's not healthy. Yeah. You know, because, I, you know, there's no reason to, to bring a guy back. Look at Dwight Howard. Dwight Howard's clearly not at 100%. Came back too early, I think. And exactly. he's having a miserable season. The Lakers look terrible. Needed to you know? address his injury concerns. And, and look where we're at now. He hasn't He's still injured, and it's still a cluster mess. Uh, over there so I don't know we'll, we'll, we'll see how it shakes out but we are starting to run out of time here so let's move real fast with a couple of other things any final thoughts on the Super Bowl obviously this is a week or two old at this point but just any final thoughts anything you haven't had I would have to loved share. to see the Niners win you know how much I hate the Ravens Same uh, but you know it didn't happen and I think it was, it was a great Super Bowl you know as bad as the first half was the second half was that good agreed that power and, outage you know, was like fantastic I, I have no complaints after watching you know it was a great game and, you know, as much as I hate Baltimore, you know, going that should be my team and, you know, that should have been my team winning the title. But, you know, you know, we're stuck with this. I don't even know what it – I don't even know a shell of whatever it is. You know, we're just stuck with expansion BS. But, you know, we've been bad now for 14 years. And it's just it, – like I said, if Cleveland actually put on a decent team over the past 14 years, I'm not saying the Super Bowl, but just, you know, five or six playoff appearances – this loss, I mean, I mean, Baltimore winning just wouldn't have hurt so much, you know. But it's the fact that we've just been so bad, and they, t- you know, they still have the same front office they had in '95 in Cleveland, you know, with Ozzie Newsom and all uh-huh. those guys still in there, you know. That's just what's so upsetting about it. And all you have to hear all these stupid Baltimore fans talking about how Art Modell's a Hall of Famer. Well, he, you know? he didn't slither in posthumously, and if he didn't get in this year with the sympathy vote, I don't see it happening. I don't see him leapfrog. I think it may eventually happen. I just hope it doesn't happen, you know, for a long time. Like I said, the guy's dead, and I don't see his family even coming. You know, his family will be lucky to even make it to Canton. Let's put it that way. I'm not threatening him. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm just saying, though, it's not going to be easy to fly into Hopkins Airport or, or to Perk Lakefront and go to Cleveland if it was the last name Modell heading to town. You know, you're going to wind up with spit in your food if you're going anywhere to eat. I'm telling you that right now. I, I think the Modells would have to be one of those one-day things where they're literally in town for the day. Yet you, know, yet you talk or, or about LeBron coming back to the Cavs. Yet you talk about LeBron, I, LeBron coming back to the Cavs. Don't forget, though, when, when, when LeBron left Cleveland... Well, he didn't take the Cavs was, with him. I, I get that. I know. Exactly my point. You know, I know. He did not take the Cavaliers with them. <laughs> well, you know, the way they played the past few years, maybe they should have, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, that, but yes. But at the same time, you know, LeBron... You know, like I said, LeBron, you know, it, it time forgives all those, you know, time forgive, you know, it, it heals all wounds. You know, especially LeBron's apologized for the decision. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm not saying what he did was right because it wasn't at all. I think he handled it very poorly. But he said he, he came out and, and basically admitted that he handled it poorly and he would have done things differently now. And I think if he returns to Cleveland in a year and a half, I, I think all will be forgiven. You know, of course, you're going to have those few stubborn Cleveland fans the ones that don't want a dome over Cleveland Brown team or didn't want a dome in the first place because they want to watch cold weather football with 30,000 fans out there. You know, the ones who won't accept him back, you know, and that's fine. I, I don't think, you know, it's going to be a small, small minority of fans that, that aren't going to want him back. You know, trust me, winning, winning trumps everything. And you, and if people want to tell me that they go, okay, you know, I'd rather watch the Cavaliers win 25 to 40 games over the next six, seven years and watch Kyrie Irving walk in free agency the Cavaliers can't put together a winner, then watch LeBron come back, watch his team win constantly 65 games a year over the next four years, and, and win two or three titles. N- anybody who says they'd rather take it because of their pride is an idiot. They, they just are. You know, and like I said, you know, I can't control people's feelings, but like I said, as being a Clevelander and growing up loving the Cavaliers and watching LeBron walk was like, it was literally like a punch in the throat. But at the same time, it, it, it's, it's, like, it's like a relationship. It's like, you know, the love of your life dumps you, 
and you know she's willing to take you back a year or two later you go back to her you know I'm saying though it's like you know because you haven't found anything better so there you go you know you can place it like that but still <laughs> the Cavaliers would be foolish Cavaliers fans well, would be foolish a, not to accept that, it that, that, that's some good Valentine's Day uh, crossover chatter a day after Valentine's Day I'll take that hey two quick thoughts then Cleveland Browns Cleveland Browns are getting ready for free agency obviously the draft you know they're sitting with a pretty high draft pick they have money to spend new ownership any quick thoughts on what you expect to see or hope to see out of the Browns? From what I'm hearing, you know, I, I'm, I, I have to, I have to create, I have to keep a positive outlook. And from what I'm hearing is that they're going to be the front runners to sign Mike Wallace. You know, apparently, you know, Lombardi's, from what I hear, is big into this double dipping thing, where you know, it's not only just signing a free agent, but signing ones from your division. And you know, if the Browns go out there and they sign Paul Kruger from, you know, from Baltimore, Donnell Ellerby, or Mike Wallace, if they wind up with the three of those guys, you know, I'll be ecstatic. You know, like I said, I'd love for them to sign Joe Flacco. I think he's worth the two first-round picks. The guy just won a Super Bowl. You know, but I, I don't know. If Baltimore doesn't place the exclusive franchise tag on him, I think you're going to see the Browns make a ridiculous offer to Flacco. Now, I'm not saying it's realistic because it's not at all, but it could happen. There's always that small chance. Interesting. Well, we'll see how it plays out. It, we'll, we'll, I, I don't know. Brandon Whedon versus – look, it, it, until we get to the draft and free agency, we got to see what their plan is moving forward with the teammates that they have and w addressing the weak spots, switching the defensive scheme, and maybe Joe Hayden can play a full season. We'll see how, how, how that happens. It, but this is unfortunately our Super Bowl time, pre-draft, pre-free agency, because now we're going to figure it out. Now we're going to turn it around. Go Browns. I, I seriously think, though, this team is turning the corner. I think, I think if Brandon Whedon is successful in this offensive scheme – you know, with Chud and Turner. And like I said, Turner has success with every quarterback. He always has. And if the Browns, if we need to be semi-successful in the system, they're going to win a lot of football games. Well, there's already rumors that Brandon Wynn's on the chopping block, that he's on the trading I, block. I, right just, I don't see that happening. I, I really don't right now. Like I said, unless they get Joe Flacco or maybe Alex Smith, I just don't see it happening. And I, I can see Alex Smith being a realistic possibility, but I see him being more realistic in a system like Kansas City or something. Or Arizona. I, I just, I actually don't see him going to Arizona because I don't think the 49ers would trade him within the division. But I don't think they're going to get anything better than a fourth round pick for Alex Smith. You know, they don't have a lot of leverage. You know, he's sitting over a $10 million salary a year. Yeah. You know, and if they can't trade him, they're eventually going to cut him. And I don't think they're going to see any team offer up a first or second round pick for him. You know, the guy's a backup. What's San Francisco going to do with him? <laughs> uh, exactly. I was calling for Alex so, Smith to come in in the second half of the of the Super Bowl, but you know what did I know? Kaepernick turned it on, so I don't know. It, it's gonna be interesting. The Mike Wallace. It would be nice to see to put an elite receiver or a very good receiver at least in with the well, young. Especially a deep threat like Mike Wallace, because having Wallace and Gordon as your deep threats would just be. I mean, it'd be huge. That would stretch the, the DBs on the other team. One on the right, yeah. one on the left, and it, you can't cover them both. Well, and then your tight ends get huge. Benjamin is fantastic. Yeah. He's in space. He's an incredible deep threat. Get a year with him. You know, have another year with him, and then Greg Little turned it on too at the end of the year. I mean, as soon as he slid into the number two role, and, his, and if you even put him in basically to number two or three role, you know, the guy he was catching everything last year at, after Gordon became the true number one. And I, I'm really, really excited. That's why I don't think Alex Smith is great fit. He didn't throw a great deep ball. I think we didn't. You know, I think like I said, we was a rookie last year. Yeah, granted, he was 29 years old, but at the same time, I still think you give him one more year because there's no quarterback in this draft that you're replacing him with. There's not one dominant quarterback in this draft that I, I, I think is worth a first-round pick. You know, Geno Smith isn't that good. It was actually funny. I still remember when I was in Miami over New Year's, and I'm at Prime 112, the steakhouse, and I remember the hostess comes up to this guy, comes out of a seven-series Beamer, and she goes, oh, are you one of the football players? He says, yes, I am. She goes, oh, name? And he goes, Geno Smith. And I look at him, I was like, I go on my phone, I was like, oh, it is Geno Smith. You know, like, he, he wasn't even recognizable. You know, he wasn't RG3, you know. You know, and I can't see I can't see him being a star at the next level. And granted, I may be wrong, but I just don't see any quarterback in, in, in this in, in this draft being a star. But Zach, your job is to evaluate talent in high school and college. Your job is to evaluate talent in the NBA and, and try to figure out. You're a scout. That's what you do. And you're obviously a big sports fan. You look at this across the board. And, and all of this stuff, it is gambling. You never know when Greg Oden's going to be injured or somebody's going to come back from injury. You never know no, when somebody's going to mature. It's a low-risk, reward situation for the Cavaliers yeah, there. Yeah. And like I said, it can't hurt. Okay, big deal. If he sits there and rots on the bench next year, you know, if he's injured, 
okay, you're still under the salary cap. It's not like anything's going on with him, you know? You're, you're only giving up two and a half, three million dollars a year. Who but cares, but you know? what I'm saying is every money. move, whether it's the Browns, the Indians, or the Cavs, everything is a gamble. Everything is going to Vegas and putting your chip down and seeing the roll of the dice, the turn of the cards. You just don't know until it plays out, and that's where we're at with, with all this sports. It's fun to guess. It's fun to fun to kind of say, well, I'm going to play GM for a day, and I would do this, and I would do that, and you know, that, that's part of the fun of sports, and you that's actually your world. But I know part of your world is going to send you down to Houston in a little bit. So since we're out of time, I'm going to wish I just, you I wanted to oh, the Indians real quick or no? Well, yeah, hey, second. you know what? I got 30 seconds for the Indians. Oh, yeah. I just have to say I, I've been incredibly impressed with their offseason. We've been citing Swisher and Michael Bourne. Going out there, getting Mike Aviles, Trevor Bauer. I'm really, really excited for the Indian season. I'm really excited for baseball season to begin. This is the first time I've really been excited since 2008. So, like I said, you know, this put me in a good mood. I, I plan on ordering extra innings this year as long as the first 10 games go well. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what. I don't think Francona was coming here without a commitment to spend money, and I think I think they worked that out and said, I will have X amount of dollars to go be active and improve this team or I'm not doing it. And I really think the Dolans listened to that. I don't think they are bringing in Francona with no budget. And it turns out, yeah, they didn't break the bank on any ridiculous deals getting Josh Hamilton or anything, but they have improved the team. And you know what? If the Cavs aren't making the playoffs and the Browns aren't drafting number one or celebrating a Super Bowl championship, we always have the Indians. So I'll tell you what, man, maybe maybe next couple of weeks we can talk some March Madness, kind of kind of start talking a little bit more of the NFL draft and, and the beginning of baseball season and uh it's always good good time having you on the show zach have a safe flight and uh we'll be talking again soon all right uh, definitely thanks for having me on once again all right take care that was zach barris make sure you follow him on twitter he's at z barris that's z b a r i s on twitter so make sure you go follow him he's always talking sporty type of things yeah he's an nba nba scout but you know he's he's, he's a indians Cavs, and browns fan uh, Buckeyes too, when it comes down to it, and that's kind of the focus here at the Unhappy Hour. We, that's what we are: Indians, Cavs, Browns, and Buckeyes fans that have been constantly jaded over the course of three decades plus. And uh, one of these days, we're going to turn it around. One of these days, we're going to get it right. One of these days, it's going to make sense. And that's why we keep doing what we're doing. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to be back with agree to disagree, talking Pope, meteors, and more on agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. Yeah, it's a radio show we have on thenewamericanmedia.com every single Friday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific. Join the show. What do we talk about? Politics, religion, and spirituality. Basically anything you're not supposed to talk about in a bar. (laughs) You're not supposed to have these conversations inside of a bar, but we have them every single Friday at 4.30 p.m. Pacific on thenewamericanmedia.com. Join the show, offer your opinion, and let's agree to disagree, but let's have a good conversation.